Alrighty, so we're going to look at intrinsic connectivity networks. And there's a reason why we're doing this one first. And that's because I want you to keep this in the back of your mind all week so that you can play with this. Because this is new, but I think it's very important for us. This comes from Riccardo Cassiani Ingoni. He has his doctoral degree in neurophysiology. He's a certification trainer, and the guy is brilliant. So <laughs> here's the simplest way to understand this. We already have in our training the brainstem, limbic system, and cortex, the triune brain. Okay, we already have that. That's a concept that came from the 1960s. But with the advancement of neuroscience, and we have to keep up with that, there are some new concepts that we can include in TRE, okay? But the way I'm going to take us from what we already know to something new is by comparing the triune brain with <clears throat> what I call the triune cortex. Now, that's a made-up name. I made it up. I should I'll have to like, get a trademark for it or something. But the reason I'm saying that is what we're doing, here's our brainstem, limbic system, and cortex. The triune cortex just means we're dividing the cortex up into smaller pieces rather than just one big lump which is all we've kind of used in TRE before. So the three pieces are these are in the cortex, what's called the salient network, okay? And this is all part of the intrinsic connectivity network. You will never have to really know these names technically or clinically. That's why I put switch. It's like a switch. That's all you have to know. You're in the switch or you're in someplace else, okay? Then we have what's called the central executive network. And that's where your thinking mode comes from, OK? And then we have the default mode network, which is the rest mode. So all we've done is we've gone above the brainstem and limbic system into the cortex. And now we're subdividing the cortex into three parts. And now I want to explain to you why this would be useful or valuable for us and why I'm teaching it first in this uh, week-long thing. I want you to play with this a little bit with yourself. And so I'm going to explain how that is. So basically, here's the three networks. But what's important to know is the salience network, which we're going to talk about now, is the network that gets the information from the brainstem and limbic system. See? So down here is our brainstem and limbic system, and it goes up into the cortex through this salience network. Okay? So <clears throat> once it gets to the salience network, then it decides, does, do I need to use my central executive network with this information? Do I need to do something or act in some way? Or is that information something that I could reflect on? Is it valuable for me to reflect on the information? Okay? And so each part of the cortex has a different role. So let's look at this. Why is it important for us? We already have in our material what we call self-reflection, okay? Or self-regulation, sorry. And self-regulation, this is from module two material, is the ability to tolerate control one's emotions, thoughts, feelings, and sensation, sensations independently of external supervision or regulation. So we already know that. If somebody freezes, floods, or dissociates, that means they're not able to self-regulate and they use us temporarily to help them with that regulation. We're already familiar with this, okay? So self-regulatory collapse is when they can't do their own self-regulation. Okay, it's just the opposite. Now here's what's key. Even in the module two training, and this is in clinical therapy, successful self-regulation is dependent on top-down control, of, meaning the cortex regains control of what's called subcortical or below the cortex regions of the brain, which for us is brainstem and limbic system. So we already know. 
when somebody freezes, floods, or dissociates, that means the brain stem and the limbic system are overriding the cortex's control, and that's why they're having the reaction. And our way of getting them out of it, out of it was always to stimulate the cortex. Since the self-regulation is dependent on understanding the cortex better, I thought this was very valuable for us to have even more insight into the cortex or the cortical region of the brain. That's why we're doing this, okay? Because this is de dependent on top-down control, so we should know more about the top. So here we are, the intrinsic connectivity network are these three parts, the default mode no network, salience network, and central executive network. Okay? So understanding the intrinsic connectivity network will help providers unify the triune brain and the polyvagal system, which I'll explain in a little bit. It's also going to help to understand the neurology of self-regulation and pendulation in the TRE process. And I will explain this also. It will provide us with a more accurate neurological explanation of freezing, flooding, and dissociation. So you and then for future neuroscience and research, and that would be for me or others involved in research, we'll most likely observe changes in these networks for TRE. So let me explain the salience network. And it's a switch. It's an on-off switch, basically. Okay, and the way it works, it, first of all, salient means what's most noticeable or important. What's the main, chief, or primary network? And this is the main or primary network because it's the switch. It's the on-off switch for the other networks. And this is the place where the information goes into from the body and the um, brain stem and limbic system, okay? Now, let's look at the responsibility and roles of the default mode network or the rest mode. The default mode network activates by default when a person is involved in self-referential tasks such as daydreaming, mind wandering, thinking about others, etc. The default mode network was discovered accidentally without any preconceived notion of it. It hadn't occurred to anyone that the brain is actually just as busy when we relax as when we focus on difficult tasks. The default mode network is comprised of several areas of the cortex that are most active when no external tasks demand our attention. When we relax, however, the default mode network is the most active area of the brain. Now, the default mode network has been shown to deactivate during external goal-oriented tasks, thus leading some researchers to label the network as the task negative network. The purpose of the default mode network is that it helps us plan tasks by reviewing past actions in order to improve future behavior. However, an overactive default mode network is highly correlated with negative mood states, dissociation, and certain mental illnesses such as depression or various psychopathologies. However, a healthy default mode network can also be associated with meditation and creativity. Now, the strength of connectivity within the default mode network appears to be correlated with post-traumatic stress symptom severity in patients with post-traumatic stress or acute post-traumatic stress symptoms. This means that they're stuck in the past and they can't come out of that mode into the present moment. So dissociative experiences are a default mode network activity. It means that the default mode network is too active and the person is stuck in too much self-referential reflection or a memory. They can't shift from memory 
into the central executive network of the here and now. They're basically stuck in a daydreaming mode. Now, let's look at the central executive network or the thinking mode. The central executive network actually inhibits the default mode network by engaging our conscious brain to think and maintain attention on a prioritized task in the present moment. It's helpful to think of the central executive network as active when you make an effort to keep your mind from wandering during a goal-directed task. The central executive network provides us with logical, analytical, and cognitive processing to assess situations and to complete tasks. Many psychiatric conditions, including ADHD, are associated with excessive activation of the central executive network, which causes poor inhibitory regulation of the default mode network. Deficiencies in this network are common in most major psychiatric and neurological disorders, including depression. So what is the application of the intrinsic connectivity network to TRE? Dysfunction in these networks are person-specific means that each individual may have different problems in each of these different networks. One system could be too weak, which cannot activate when necessary, or one of the networks is too strong, which prevents the other systems from activating, or the entire network is not working together in a unified way as intrinsically connected, creating a problem in how they switch to each other. Individuals with post-traumatic stress have difficulty in their ability to engage and switch between task irrelevant, default mode network behaviors, and task relevant, central executive network behaviors in the brain network. Now, freezing, dissociation, and flooding are very easy to understand through this intrinsic connectivity network. Freezing is when too much stimulation or information is coming into the salience network, and it can't switch to either the default mode network, which causes the person not to know how they feel, or the central executive network, which causes the person not to know what to do. Dissociation is too much stimulation or information, and it's overstimulating the default mode network, and they get lost in a past sensation or memory. And flooding is when too much information is going into the central executive network and they become overly stimulated and activated. So regulation of the intrinsic connectivity network is very important for the TRE provider to understand. One sign of balance is that the person can access all three of these networks at will. So that's going to be one of our goals to help individuals move back and forth throughout these three networks. By regulating the TRE process, we are providing the right amount of information and stimulation to the salience network, which ultimately can strengthen and balance the interconnectedness of the three networks. It is important for us to regulate the TRE process so the individual can experience moving between these three networks for the purpose of improving self-regulation and pendulation. So one of the ways to do this is to slow down the TRE process. So we start with the session with asking the person to reflect how they feel in the present moment which is activating the central executive network. Then we shift into activating the tremors 
as a way of activating the conscious control of the salience network. And then when the session is completed, we bring them into self-reflecting and asking about what has shifted in you, which is the default mode network. And this is a way to help those two states become stronger and independent. The value of this neurological awareness is that it can help us as TRE providers guide people through their own self-regulation by understanding the neurological principles behind this process.